So we're continuing from last night's first part of the uh, 
four-part seminar on the mind. And this is a verse from the fifth canto, eleventh chapter. Jadbar instructs King Rahugana, and this is the last verse in the chapter. And this verse concludes a series of verses about the mind. Rituvam hmm. menatara badraviryam Pratravam enatar abadraviryam Upeksaya bhyediditam apramataha You don't like that one. We'll, maybe we'll try another tune here. Brityavam enam tarabadraviryam Upaksaya deya ditam apratamaha Guru haras charo pasannastro Jahi vali kam swayam atma mosam Brat Pratyam enam tara badraviryam Apexyaya deye ditam apratamaha Guru haras chano pasanas Guru haras chano pasanastro Jahi vali kam swayam atma mosam Chant? Ladies, go ahead. Anyone else?
Adye di Tang unnecessarily increased in power. Apramata Apramata one who is without illusion. Guru of the spiritual master. Hare of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Charana of the Lotus Feet. Upasana Astra applying the weapon of worshipping. Jahi conquer. Valikam faults. Swayam personality. I'm sorry, personally. Yeah. Atmamo sum, which covers the constitutional position of the living entity. So, um, Judd Bart, he is now preaching to this king, King Rahugana, who is quite a proud king, and he thinks he is a king. That's his problem. And he's acting in his very arrogant way towards Judd. And Judd is taking the opportunity to instruct him. So this is a series of instructions. Now he's talking about the mind. He says, this uncontrolled mind is the greatest enemy of the living entity. If one neglects it or gives it a chance, it will grow more and more powerful and will become victorious. Although it is not factual, it is very strong. It covers the constitutional position of the soul. O king, please try to conquer this mind by the weapon of service to the lotus feet of the spiritual master and the supreme personality of Godhead. Do this with great care. Srila Prabhupada's purport. This first line is quite powerful. There is one easy way with which the mind can be conquered. Neglect. Everyone repeat, there is one easy my way, uh, there is one easy weapon with which the mind can be conquered. Neglect. Okay. The mind is always telling us what to do this, to do that. Therefore, we should be very expert in disobeying the mind's orders. Gradually, the mind should be trained to obey the orders of the soul. It is not that one should obey the orders of the mind. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur used to say that the control mind, one, in order to control the mind, one should beat it with shoes many times, just after awakening it and before going to sleep. In this way, one can control the mind. This is the instructions of all Shastras. If one does not do so, one is doomed to follow the dictations of the mind. Another bona fide process is to abide strictly by the orders of the spiritual master and engage in the Lord's service. Then the mind will be automatically controlled. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has instructed Srila Rupa Goswami, Brahmanda Brahmite Kona Bhogivana Ji, Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai, Bhakti Lata Bij. When one receives the seat of devotional service by the mercy of Guru and Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one real life begins. If one abides by the order of the spiritual master, by the grace of Krishna, he is freed from service to the mind. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gina Jina Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutoi Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swamin Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaurvani Pacharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Sutarine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasudeva Gaur Bhaktivin 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So here, in concluding this particular chapter with the subject of the mind, of course, he does go on to speak more to King Rahugana. And now, Judd Bharat is saying, and he's just simply speaking from Shastra. And this is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita by Krishna, that one who controls the mind, the mind is the best of friend. And one who fails to do that, his mind is his greatest enemy. Not just enemy, but greatest enemy. So we all have a mind, because we have a body, and therefore mind comes along with that material body. And so we have to work with this mind. So the mind is chanchalam hi mena krishna amati balabhadrita. It's restless, turbulent, it's unsteady. And Arjun, we mentioned this last night, he's speaking to Krishna and he's explaining, you're asking me to control the mind, I think it's easier to control the wind. He's speaking from, you know, from realization, how much Krishna had to preach to him in order to get him to understand what was the right thing to do. Although he was associating with Krishna, he had his own ideas. <laughs> he had the association of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but still, he had a different mind. And therefore, Krishna had to instruct him gradually and explain to him that ultimately, the mind has to be engaged in the service of the Lord according to the instructions given by the Lord and by the spiritual master. Here, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and Srila Prabhupada, in many of his lectures, mentions it over and over again that the two most difficult times to control the mind is early in the morning and late at night. Seems like these times, which are somewhat affected by the atmosphere, are the times where one should be more diligent in controlling the mind. Of course, when we wake up, the first thing we do is we offer our obeisances to our spiritual master and remember the Lord who we're serving. We say, Shishi Kishori Kishori Ki Jai. And then we remember our spiritual master. And of course, along with Srila Prabhupada. And then we are somewhat forgetful after that until we get to our japa. There's that big gap in between. The time you will have to take care of the physical body and then finally sit down and chant japa. Or go to the Mangal Arte. But that time the mind is going everywhere. So it's good, very good, this is Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says here, one should beat the mind with shoes. And Prabhupada used to carry a pair of shoes with him and said, anyone who needs it, let me know. <laughs> he would, he would. And sometimes the devotees would come up to Prabhupada and he would hit him with these. Some, some minds would need not only army boots, but, you know, some kind of, you know, some... I don't know what else is worse than that, but anyway. <laughs> so the mind is very restless. Now, to control the mind means to direct the mind in the right way. But if we allow the mind to remain uncontrolled, in other words, if we give freedom to the mind, here it says the mind will become more stronger. So sometimes we sit down and we try to chant drapa, and it becomes like trying to climb... Mount Kilimanjaro with a backpack on your back it becomes an impossible. Why? Because throughout the day, we're not really dealing with the mind. So what we do in the sadhana, in the morning, and the ability to control the mind is very much influence how much we control the mind throughout the rest of the day, keeping the mind in the right mood or in the right direction. But if, if that's not happening, then you can see it'll be mind becomes very restless. 
restless is one of the, I think, the best definitions for the mind. It's never satisfied. Whatever you give it, it doesn't like. Or if it does like it, it simply wants more. You can't satisfy the mind. The only way you can satisfy the mind is when you put the mind at the lotus feet of Lord in devotional service. So it's mentioned there's three ways one can somehow conquer over the restless mind. One is mentioned here, and which is the main one. As it says here, King Ruhugana says, by the weapon of service to the lotus feet of the spiritual master and to the supreme personality of Godhead. He mentions both because sometimes there is a class of spiritualists who just want to serve guru. They are called mayavadis. For them, guru is everything. Guru Brahma, Guru Shiva, Guru Vishnu, Guru, Guru, Guru. Guru is everything, but nothing about God. And there's another class of spiritualists, so-called spiritualists, who say that we don't need guru, all we need is God. And say, therefore, we should just uh, focus on God. But here, they are inseparable. Guru and Krishna are inseparable. It's like, I remember when we were in New Vrindavan in 1970. Six and Prabhupada came. So Prabhupada came and he sat down to accept the Guru Puja. So we were singing the Guru Vandanam prayers. So one of our devotees was singing the prayers. And when he finished the prayers, he stopped. And then Prabhupada looked at his uh, servant, who picked, immediately picked up the Murdanga and started chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And then the kirtan went on. So later on, we were thinking, well, well, why did Prabhupada do that? And after inquiring, Prabhupada revealed it to us. He said, you cannot worship Guru without worshiping Krishna. And you cannot worship Krishna without worshiping Guru. And then he explained how these categories of spiritualists, they either choose one or the other. So here it's mentioned that these are two inseparable entities, Guru and Krishna, like that. So worshiping Krishna means to follow carefully the instructions of the spiritual master. And worshiping Krishna means to, to follow the, to worship, to worship Guru means to develop our relationship with Krishna. So both are giving instructions relevant to our connection with both Guru and Krishna. So here, back to the mind. So that's one way to control the mind. But can we in, be engaged 24 hours a day in devotional service? Have we, have we reached that platform of purity where we're 24 hours, 24 seven. That means even that during your sleeping hours, you're absorbed in Krishna. And there are great souls who can do that and have done that. So, well, what is another way to control the mind? And here's where it becomes more practical for us. And that is to meditate or to remember the instructions of the spiritual master. This can be done throughout the day. In each and every situation we are in, what did my spiritual master say? What did Srila Prabhupada say in regards to how I should behave, how, how I should execute my service? In other words, we have a reference and for everything we think of and everything we do by the spiritual master, it's called Guru, what is it called? It's called Chast Shastra Chakshus. Shastra means scripture and Chakshus means vision or see. One who sees through the eyes of scripture. If we're seeing with these material eyes and we see the external environment accordingly, we're not actually seeing. We're seeing the impressions of the external energy based on our understanding within the mind. That's all. So just like if we see a person, 
what do we see? We see their body, but we know also that that person is part and parcel of Krishna. Vidyaya vidna sammane brahmani gavi hastini suni chaiva svapake cha pandita samadarshanaha. One who actually sees is actually seeing that in the hearts of every living entity there's Krishna there. Even in the most insignificant insect, there is a God that is situated in the heart of that living entity. Therefore, that is vision. And then how do we see the external environment? The things that are, what we say, inanimate or jutta, dead. How do we see the things in this world? Well, there's two ways to see it. One is that everything is a combination of the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether. That's all it is. This desk was once part of a tree, and it's made out of wood. And inside this wood, there's fire. And there's also air. So in this, so you can also understand that every material element is a combination of these five ingredients. But how do devotees see everything? This is where we see, see my glasses, what do you see? And the devotee said, oh, Prabhupada, we say, well, that, well, that's your glasses. Prabhupada says, yes. He said, this is how you visualize everything. Everything in this world belongs to Krishna. Everything in this world is controlled by Krishna. And everything in this world is meant to be enjoyed by Krishna. So when you see like that, you're free. <laughs> and that is actually freedom. Where we get entangled, entangled in the mind and the material energy is and we start to try to control and enjoy these things in this world. <laughs> and that's where we get. We can control things in order to make things happen for the benefit of others and for the benefit of Krishna. But to try to control things for our own enjoyment causes us to get entangled by the object we try to computer to some degree. <laughs> because you have given yourself over to that machine. And you think, well, I have a computer, but the computer has you. <laughs> and that's true <laughs> with anything in this material world. Anything we want to possess, we may have things, but if we don't possess the objects we have, it doesn't control us. We can use it, and it's, we're free from the entanglement of that object. But as soon as we try to enjoy it, or what we say, what's another way, or, or whether we dislike something, if we like something or dislike, we get entangled by both of those things. So one should live in this world in a neutral way, seeing everything as a part and parcel of Krishna, including me. In other words, myself is also, and therefore everything belongs to Krishna. And then, what do we do? Then we engage in devotional service. Or, if we're not engaged in devotional service, we're engaged in other activities such as maintaining family or taking care of our possessions. We do this as a service to the Lord, and we do it in the best possible way in order to get the maximum amount of benefit. But we are not the enjoyer, we're simply the servant, that's all. If we see like this, or develop the consciousness like this, then life becomes easy. Then, if you lose something, no problem. If you gain something, no problem. Anyway, but the mind wants to possess, the mind wants to enjoy, the mind wants to complain, the mind wants to do whatever it wants to do. And so, by listening to the dictations to the mind, we become entangled in the material energy. And this is what's being mentioned here. Now, there's a third way to control the mind. And this is even a little, when we say, you see people in the material world, they do this. And there was a survey that was taken in the United States of America if you want to go for any surveys, the U.S. is an expert at doing surveys because they have nothing else to do. <laughs> they just do survey. Let surveys, you know, how many colored bugs are there in red and blue? You know, they make a survey for everything. You know, <laughs> Gallup polls and this poll, that poll, this survey. Well, anyway, they, some of these surveys are very instructive. So one survey was, what is, a, 
what is the quality of people who are actually happy? What is their activities and what is their quality? So they concluded that people are actually happy if they're very busy, they're active throughout the day, and they work for the benefit of others. In other words, they're trying to serve others. They're considered to be good do-gooders. In other words, they make their life a feature of benefiting others. They want to help others. And those are the happiest people materially, generally. Others that don't do that, they, they just, when they try to make themselves happy, they're miserable. <laughs> because we don't know how to make ourselves happy, that's the problem. <laughs> and so, therefore, it's mentioned here also for devotees, one who works for the benefit of others also becomes what we say, the mind becomes fixed, the mind becomes controlled. So, do you do anything for yourself? Yes, you do. Because you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of others. That's also important. But if you do either one exclusively, you will not succeed. I remember I was in Minnesota, and I was giving a class. We were talking about uh, working for the benefit of others. And there was one lady, and she was there. She was in her 50s. And she looked quite unhappy. And uh, so we were talking, and she told me she is always trying to help people who are suffering, people who are suicidal, people who, are who get addicted to intoxications, people who are drug addicts. In other words, she's always trying to do something to help these people. And she works hard at it. But one of the problems was she forgot, she forgets about herself. And therefore, she doesn't take care of her health, she doesn't take care of her personal needs. So after a while, her ability to help others was also going down. Because she had less to give, because she, was, she wasn't you know, taking care of herself nicely. So I basically said, you know, once you take a break, go on a little vacation, take care of your health, do something you like. <laughs> and she said, I can't do that. <laughs> She's so attached to helping others, she can't help them. She can't take it. And I found out why. It's the false ego. She gets satisfaction from this idea of helping others, and she feels good about it. It's not so. Much, it's also helping others, but her she's getting a portion of this that it satisfies my sense of ego that I'm helping others. I feel good about that, and others feel good about me. So that gives me this prestige, this feeling. So she wants to be known as a nice person, and she wants to feel like she's a nice person to herself. So it's false ego. <laughs> it's not real ego although she's doing apparently something good. But she forgot the main thing, that the soul is in the body. And if you don't take care of yourself, you're neglecting your soul also. And you're neglecting the uh, super soul who sits next to you in the body by not worshiping the super soul or the soul. So just to make a point that that's, there's a balance between helping others and taking care of our personal needs like that. Usually we err one way or the other. We err, if it's convenient, I'll help others. And that, that doesn't work either. <laughs> that doesn't work either. <laughs> if it's convenient, devotees should go out of their way to try to serve other devotees should make plans to serve other devotees, should think how to serve other devotees. And by doing that, we actually can control the mind nicely and Krishna is very pleased like that. So Vaishnav Seva is one of the best ways to control the mind and at the same time, it is a way to please Krishna. Because Krishna says, if you think you're my devotee, you're not. But if you know you're a devotee of my devotee, then you're actually my devotee. So Krishna makes that point. It's in the Adi Purana. So therefore, keeping the mind under control means to use the mind to serve. So we're serving the spiritual master. We're serving the Lord. 
but we have to serve the other Vaishnavas also like them. And then the mind doesn't have time to worry about. Because so, soon as cause they say, what does they say? Idle mind is what? Devil's workshop. It's not a cliche. It's actually a, a reality. As soon as the mind has nothing to do, what does it start to think about? Sense gratification. How can I satisfy something about myself? Yeah, I mean it. So learning to keep, because the mind is always moving. It's always moving one way or the other. It's moving through thoughts. It's moving through emotions. It's moving through reflections. It's, and it's usually complaining about something, right? <laughs> or somebody. <laughs> and that's the nature of the mind. So bringing the mind onto the lotus feet of the Lord in devotional service means to actually um, keep the mind where it belongs and gradually the mind will become more and more peaceful because on the spiritual level there is complete peace. On the material level, on the level of the mode of ignorance, there is only unhappiness. On the, mode, on the mode of passion, there is only anxiety. And on the mode of goodness, there is only illusion of happiness. <laughs> Just like Prabhupada was talking about, there's no happiness in this material world. And he was just going on and on and on. Any other devotees are listening and they're asking questions and then a challenging one. But Prabhupada, the mode of goodness, says that there's happiness. Prabhupada said, but the main principle of the mode of goodness is knowledge. And that knowledge tells you there's no happiness here. <laughs> and Prabhupada clarified our illusion here. <laughs> So in that way, um, and then, of course, as soon as we reach the transcendental platform. Transcendental platform means to be engaged in devotional service. We can still be engaged in devotional service in the mode of ignorance. We can be engaged in the mode of devotional service in the mode of passion. We can be engaged in the mode of devotional service in the mode of goodness, or we can be in transcendental consciousness. So how do you, what is the distinction? Mode of ignorance means I'm trying to destroy my enemy through devotional service. <laughs> I'm doing devotional service and I'm throwing out these fiery arrows at people I don't like and saying, Krishna, kill him, you know. <laughs> In other words, using God to, have to uh, use your, to, uh, uh, these are, this is mode of ignorance. Devotional serving in the mode of passion means I'm attached to the results. I work hard, and if the results don't come, I'm unhappy. And if I, the results come, I'm happy. That's called fruit of activity. <clears throat> and fruit of activity binds one to this idea of happiness and distress. Like that. Through devotional service, I, I get what I want or I don't get what I want. Even if I don't get any happiness, I'm unhappy because I didn't get any happiness. That's another form of attachment. Devotional service in the mode of goodness. <clears throat> I have some knowledge. I'm feeling some peace, but I'm attached to the mode of goodness. I'm attached to being good. As opposed to, I'm attached to being a devotee. In other words, if there's some this feeling of prestige, some happiness that comes with pious activities. Pious activities are generally in the mode of goodness. I do good, I'm, you know, I'm doing devotional service. I'm still looking for something for myself. I'm not attached to the results, but I want to get some knowledge. I want to get some happiness. That's devotional service in the mode of goodness. Now, devotional service and transcendence is avyabhila sita sunya, jnana karmana navritam, anukulena krishna silanam bhakti uttamam. Most devotional service and transcendence means that I'm trying to please Krishna. That's all. We're acting to please Krishna. 
and acting in to please Krishna's devotees, then we're on the transcendental platform. There are people who please Krishna but don't are not trying to please Krishna. The demons. The demons please Krishna, but they're not trying to please Krishna. How is that? They want to fight with Krishna, and Krishna likes to fight. So, right? You like to fight, right? Or you like to teach other people how to fight. So if they fight with you, that's nice, right? You're pleased. But they're not trying to please you by fighting. They're trying to become a good fighter, and so <laughs> So in the same way... Krishna, he likes to fight and he always wins too, he never loses. So the demons get liberation because they please Krishna, but they don't get bhakti because they're not trying to please Krishna. And that's the point. So devotional service means to do something for Krishna with the desire to please Krishna, like that. And that's devotional service. So when we act on that platform, and then when the mind... The senses, the intelligence, and all the body is engaged in devotional service. That is called full devotional service, complete devotional service. If we're en engaged in the activity of devotional service, but our mind is somewhere else while we're doing the activity, then we're not fully part of that activity. Therefore, bring the mind. Just like when we chant japa, we should hear nicely. We might be chanting the, the names, but we're not hearing. Or the hearing is going on in the background, and the mind is somewhere else. So then bringing the mind, or focusing the, the mind by uh, aiming the hearing process onto the sound vibration, and keeping it there as much as possible through various means, then gradually then one becomes absorbed in whatever you're doing, whether it's chanting, hearing, or even practical devotional service. So, it's a work. I mean, to control the mind is not easy. It's very difficult. Subari Muni was a great personality. He was meditating underwater for many years. And somehow or other, just noticing two fishes engaged in couples, copulating in the water, he started to notice that, and his mind got deviated from his meditation. After that deviation, he actually started to develop attraction for that activity, and then he wound up getting married because of that. So you see, sometimes people who are very rigid to control the mind, they somehow or other slip but devotional service is different than just controlling the mind. Because when you gauge your mind in devotional service, you have the mercy of the Lord there. And if one way, it can move that way. The mind is very quick and very, what we say, what's the word? You don't even know it's happening. <laughs> it's kind of like almost covert, how the mind moves away from where you want it to be. Oh, really? How did I get here? <laughs> so, yeah, but when you keep the mind engaged in devotional service, or the activities of devotional service, then the mind is controlled. So these are some activities. And here, Prabhupada mentions in the first sentence, there is one easy way with which the mind can be conquered and neglect. Don't listen to it. <laughs> Only when it tells you about devotional service, about Krishna, about doing good to others, then you can listen to it. If it tells you other things, you can just say, mind, you know, go away. <laughs> Do something different. A mother's trying to take care of the household. The child is pulling on the mother's dress. And she can't, you know, get her work done. And she's trying to tell the child, you do this, you do that, you do this. Finally, she just doesn't pay attention to the child and he gets tired and goes away. <laughs> so we have to learn to neglect the mind. This is one, one feature. And Prabhupada said one easy way 
to control the mind is learning how to not listen to the mind's demands like that. So what's the difference between the intelligence and the mind? They have different functions, yeah. What was the three features we mentioned last night for the mind? Right, the mind thinks, gets a feel for the thought, and then acts or doesn't act based on that feeling. Okay, now, what is the, what is the function of the intelligence? Discrimination and what a, huh? determination. It becomes determined to carry out something or it, in, based on its discrimination according to what the mind thinks. Like that. It's, a, it's a higher, more subtle feature of the mind. I'll give you an example. Maybe you've been in this situation. You're standing up high on the building and you look down and the mind says, jump. And the intelligence says, no. <laughs> so you see the difference, right? Sometimes the mind tells you to do something and you know it's completely crazy. And then why? Because, but sometimes when the intelligence is not working and the mind says, jump, you say, yeah, maybe I can fly. <laughs> this happened to our devotees in, uh, in uh, 55 street in New York, we had a building which was completely haunted by ghosts. The, the, the top floor, and devotees were using that for an ashram. So one boy got haunted by one ghost, one devotee, and he jumped. And on his way down, he said, oh no. He realized on the way down that it's too late. So somehow or other, something controlled his mind and forced his mind to act against anything that was possibly beneficial. So therefore, one has to be very, even within ourselves, you know, there is these tendencies from previous lives. They can come to the surface. One has to be very strong in intelligence and keeping the intelligence connected to Shastra, Guru, like that. And then one is, has a tendency to move the mind or the facility to move the mind in the right direction. Prabhupada makes one, he's giving a lecture, he says, never trust your mind, always distrust. He says, where is that written in Shastra? It is not. But he says, it is current. In other words, it is the words of the Acharyas. The Acharyas tell us this, therefore, it has value like that. So learn how to not trust your mind, trust only Krishna, Guru, like that, and then you'll always be in the best position to make progress, both materially and spiritually. Like that. Any comments or questions? Yes, Karunya Nidhi. What is the relationship between desire and mind? What is the difference between desire and mind? Relation, relationship. Relationship between desire and mind. Desire is the feature, is a part of the mind, but the mind carries out the desire by acting or thinking or speaking like that. So desires are within the mind. Emotions are also part of the mind's makeup. Experiences are in the mind also. Likes and dislikes, they're also in the mind. All these things. So when we get a feeling, thinking, feeling, and then we act, and that is the, you know, the function of the mind is to act. So you... You have a desire, you want to fulfill a desire, and the mind tells you how to fulfill a desire. I don't like this guy over here. My mind says to punch him, okay. <laughs> <laughs> My
my wife, I don't want to get into that one. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many different things. Therefore, you always should be checking the thoughts of the mind before you act and see if actually what will be the result. It says an intelligent person can see the results before the activity. Sometimes we do something not knowing what the results are going to be. One who is intelligent will always see, if I do this or say this, what will be the result? So think like that first. You might still go ahead and do it, but at least you're going to check in and see whether it's, what we say, beneficial or not beneficial based on your experience and based on your intelligence. Yeah. Is that okay? And uh, one more thing. That, uh, Did you get that one? Yeah. You yeah, sure? thank you. Okay. And uh, one more thing. That uh, we, we read one verse there in Bhagavad Gita that that uh, how like smoke, like smoke covers the fire. So like the lost covers intelligence. Right. And uh, so, but in this verse, it is stated that uh, soul is covered by the mind. Oh, no, sorry, mind is cover, covering soul. The mind is covering the soul. So right. that, what is the role of lust here then? Well, there's different degrees of lust. So how much the, how much the soul is covered by the mind's lusty desires is all... Is that is those verses, as smoke, embryo, and what's the other one? Fire. Mirror, mirror. mirror that's right. Yeah, mirror. As the dust is, as the dust covers the mirror, as the embryo covers the wound, as smoke covers the fire. So different degrees of lust are within the mind, mm -hmm. which is covering the soul. Mm -hmm. So, some people are more covered than others. <laughs> That's the different modes of material nature. Those who are in a mode of ignorance, they're, mo they're very covered. Those in mode of passion, a little less. Those in mode of goodness, they're only a little covered. And those who are in transcendence, their, their, mind, their soul is connected to Krishna through the mind and not covered by the mind. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. So, I was going to ask you a question, but it, thinks, it seems that you already gave the answer. Um, my question was, to some extent you gave the answer for Karuna Deepak's question, that include my answer also. My question was, uh, the soul is independent, it has nothing to do with the mind. And when soul is engaged in bhakti, and although the mind is covered by so many contamination, um, then why the offenses are counted? Because soul has nothing to do with mind. Soul is involved in bhakti. If you're actually engaged in devotional service, there's no offenses. But if, you're engaged, if your mind is somewhere else, why you're doing devotional service or doing the activities of devotional service, so you're not fully in devotional service. So therefore, wherever the mind's going, it's also going to influence you or your activities. So you have to bring your mind into the activity also. Just like sometimes we say, the, the parent says, mind what I say. We use the word mind. Mind what I say. In other words, they're instructing someone, bring your mind to what I'm, what I'm talking about. Or, so the word mind is used also to indicate that either you're there or you're not there. <laughs> Continuation. So we have seen the sometimes advanced devotee getting angry or chastising, or something coming up. So that's a sign of anger. Still is in bhakti. So well, there's righteous anger. There's krodha bhakta. That's, that anger is devotional service. 
But every other form of anger is just due to one's attachments. And they say anger is the younger brother of desire. When desire is not fulfilled, anger becomes awakened. So unfulfilled desires bring anger, bring lamentation. I, uh, we lament, oh, I didn't get it. Or we got it and we think, oh, I got it. Oh, but it's not giving me the happiness I want. I wanted this girl. I chased her for 400 years and I finally got her. And now she's making me miserable. <laughs> This guy looks so intelligent. As soon as I talk to him, I wish I didn't say anything. <laughs> so, you know, we always lament about the wrong choices. <laughs> Can you do? The mind is always conceiving certain things, and then, but the actual results are different <laughs> a lot of times. Therefore, you have to use your intelligence. This is the whole process of bhakti. It's all about intelligence. It's in Krishna says, Prabhupada said to one devotee, one devotee, Prabhupada, he said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I'm not intelligent. The Prabhupada said, then get some. <laughs> you gotta, even if you don't have it, get it somewhere. <laughs> borrow it or even steal it <laughs> but so intelligence and jiva goswami explains intelligence keeps the soul connected to krishna through the intelligence not through the mind that's why Prabhupada always emphasizes it, this whole process of krishna consciousness is for those who are intelligent and if you don't have it get it <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> and people have different types of intelligence, but that intelligence to discriminate between what is devotional service and what is not is real intelligence. Because <laughs> intelligence can go off in different branches of itself also. What is beneficial for my spiritual progress? What is not beneficial? And that's Sanatana Goswami makes that point. He said, this is necessary, otherwise you are not able to engage in devotional service. It's called anukulena and pratikul. Mm -hmm. Anukul, anu means favorable, prati means against. What is favorable for the soul, what is against the soul's interest. Like that. So therefore, how do we, what's the answer? Read the books, chant the holy names. Hear the classes. Connect to the sound vibration. When we're connected to spiritual sound vibration, we're, we're feeding our intelligence constantly. Yeah. It's Sunil Prabhu. <laughs> Thank you, Krishna Maharaj. Thank you. Uh, didn't uh, Buddhi Yoga uh, Krishna mentions in the Bhagavad Gita? Buddhi yes. Yoga? Yeah, Tesanam Satat Yuktanam Bajatam Priti Parvakam. Right. Tadami Buddhi Yogam Temam Vipantite. So that Buddhi Yoga means intelligent. Right. So Krishna, when we are trying to serve Krishna constantly, then he himself gives us some intelligence mm -hmm. that we can come to him. Yeah. Yeah, Buddha Yoga is Bhakti Yoga. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Subha. Oh. That's okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you. Apart from association with this material existence, what is the root cause of false ego? What about material nature? causes us to want to lord it over everything that we see. Well, that's, that's false ego. False ego means I'm the controller, I'm the enjoyer. And how it manifests in different forms of itself. So we take different roles in trying to enjoy and try to control, and these are all features of the false ego. But you mentioned it, yeah. 
the desire to lord it over is the principle of the false ego. And the desire, why do was we want to lord it over? So we can enjoy. I have to control in order so I can enjoy. That's, that's false ego. Thank you. Yeah, and it takes different forms. You know, like, I want to be, I want to get this position so I can enjoy. I want to get this person so I can enjoy. I want to get this uh, money so I can enjoy. I want to do this so I can enjoy. I want to arrange this so I can enjoy. I want to make a nice arrangement for other people so they can enjoy and I can enjoy enjoying them enjoy. <laughs> I was mentioning last night, and this is an interesting thing, Bhakti Tirtha Swami mentioned. I did it. <laughs> You're taking credit is another form of false ego. Because the Bhagavad Gita explains that every activity has five factors, and the soul is only one of the five. Without these other four, no activity can, can, can actually can be completed. And one of the five is the super soul. Prabhupada says, you're controlled at every moment. When you realize that you're controlled at every moment, then you, you want to get free from that control and be controlled by Krishna. So if we're not controlled by Krishna, then we're controlled by the false ego. And how it takes different forms, this situation, that situation. It's all manifestations of the false ego. False ego means something that is different than who I am. So there is real ego. Jivar Sarupai Krishna Nichitas. My only identity is I'm eternal servant of Krishna. That's my only identity. There's no other identity. Whatever other identities have is based on this body and they're temporary and they're always changing. Therefore, they're false. Does that help? Yeah. I was also wondering what's the exact origin of the false ego? How did we come under its control if we yeah. were all... The, the end, it's called envy of Krishna. And that's the or origin. Prabhupada says, we fall to this material world because we're envious of God. <laughs> That's the origin. Mm -hmm. In other words, we want to be the enjoyer and we don't want Krishna to be the enjoyer. <laughs> the soul has a propensity to enjoy. And so therefore, when one acts on that propensity, independent of Krishna, that's, that's enviousness of Krishna. We're trying to be independent of Krishna. So when you try to make Krishna enjoy, then you enjoy. <laughs> See, that's the whole thing. So everyone's thinking, if I make myself enjoy, then I enjoy. But if you make Krishna enjoy, because you you're connected to Krishna, you're part of Krishna. When Krishna is happy, then you're automatically happy. When you make Krishna enjoy, you automatically enjoy. When you, and of course, when you make Krishna's devotees, you also know Krishna, the spiritual master. When you do something that gives satisfaction to others, there's a sense of enjoyment there also. And if you do something to give satisfaction to yourself, you get some enjoyment, but then also the false ego comes and, and there's a little pride there, some prestige that comes. 100% of the time, <laughs> there'll be times where you won't get some satisfaction from something. And if you're used to getting it, then you'll start to think, oh, maybe I should do something else. I tried, it's like one person, I'm chanting Hare Krishna, I've been doing it for nine years, so I quit because I'm not getting anything out of it. Well, maybe you should chant the proper way. <laughs> and then you'll get something out of it. Doesn't mean because I'm chanting and then I didn't get anything out of it or it's too hard. Therefore, the chanting is no good. It's useless. It's good for everybody else, but not for me. 
No, it's just, it's, chanting is Krishna. It's, it's beneficial for all, except you have to approach the holy name in the right way. And, and then with the right attitude. <laughs> like that. Otherwise, you might go on chanting for hundreds of years and not get very much out of it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Next, Mataji. Narash, I, um, I, I was very uh, intrigued about. Well, not intrigued, but you know, appreciating uh, Prabhupada's uh, statements of one of the weapons, or the weapon that was pointed out actually in the verse and Prabhupada's purport of service to the spiritual master is a weapon it's a weapon to conquer the mind mm. and you mention it in terms of um, this fine balance between service or selfless service and and personal care and we know that in our devotee life like that and i wanted to ask you if you can comment on in terms of trying to understand our personal needs in order to fulfill the service to our spiritual master how we can recognize that the mind is the one who is dictating sometimes we see that um, you know we think that these are my needs and because of that it takes so much priority of taking care of yourself and taking care of yourself that at one point you're not available for selfless service so there is this that fine line is not easy to to ascertain and then there's the mind dictating or having ideas or i think it's based on your sincerity if you're actually trying to do the right thing eventually you you'll come to the right thing <clears throat> It might be trial and error. If you're not fully sincere, you'll get something less than what you actually are trying to do. So I want to, just like there's a thing called weakness of heart. Weakness of heart means I know what's right, but I can't do it. <laughs> Dhritarashtra, he knew his sons were wrong, but still, because he was attached to his sons, he went against the Pandavas. He knew it. He knew they were wrong. He knew the Pandavas were right. But he was so attached that he couldn't do anything else. So there are times we also feel like, you know, I know I shouldn't eat this next pizza, pizza, pizza. I can't move already, but it still tastes good. And so I take one more piece and no. Where's the doctor, you know? So, you know, we know something is not going to be good, but still, because there's that desire there, we go ahead and do it anyways. So the idea is the desires don't go away, but the sincerity to do the right thing will push the, the desires out eventually. So it may not come initially, but you should work at it. I want, I want to serve Krishna in the best possible way, and I need to make some arrangements. Let me see what I need to make. Just like, I'll give you an example from my own life. You know, I came here last year, and I lost my luggage for seven weeks. Finally got it back. <laughs> and then uh, just about... A month ago, again, I lost my luggage. And I'm thinking, all right, Krishna, what are you telling me? Then I realize I got too much stuff. <laughs> so now I just start cutting down on the stuff that I carry around. And I thought, there was a message in there. Because <laughs> there's there's always two reasons why something happens. There's the rem the immediate cause and there's the remote cause and the remote cause is Krishna the immediate cause is what happens on this level 
So we can learn sometimes we, we're doing something, but it's not right, and Krishna shows you, oh, this is not right. So you have to check, check in and make that adjustment. But it's based on sincerity. Nectar devotion says, success in Krishna consciousness simply sits on the principle of complete sincerity to do the right thing. In other words, to please Krishna. Yeah, if you're sincere, you'll do the right thing eventually. <laughs> but then again, you have to see whether I'm sincere or I'm just acting sincere. <laughs> Mataji's next. I did? Okay, she said I answered her question. Okay. Yeah, you Prabhu over there. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, you mentioned the relationship between uh, intelligence and devotional service, and now in the equation comes sincerity. Um, there's a person that comes here um, that evidently he's sick, he's a mentally sick person. He actually verbalized it, and uh, evidently also he's not an intelligent person. He is obsessed with God and he comes and prays for every and each person he knows. And he comes and bow down in front of the deities, in front of um, Srila Prabhupada, in front of all the deities we have. And then he goes across the street to uh, San Jerome and he is honestly a person that loves God and has a close relationship with him or he's looking for it but there's no none of these elements that you for mention he's he, him. well he's that's good he just lacks the intelligence and how to carry out it he's, he's yeah he doesn't belong in this world <laughs> Because actually, when you get so much in love with God, you can't function. <laughs> you look like you're completely crazy. <laughs> then they, then you're, then you're. At that point, you're worthy to go back home, back to God. When you can't function here anymore, when you look at your wife or your husband, you say, "Ah." Oh. <laughs> when you look at your bank balance, you say, "Ah." Oh. When you look at your car, you say, oh, oh, oh. nothing, no, nothing, there's nothing that, when you're completely devoid of any attachment to everything and everything looks miserable, then you're ready to go back to God. Not miserable without attachment to Krishna, you have to have that attachment to Krishna too, not just miserable. There's some people who are just like everything's miserable, and then they're miserable too. But that, yeah. So it explains in the nectar of the no nectar of no, Chaitanya Charitamrita and in Bhagavatam that when one chants the holy names of the Lord and he becomes so ecstatic, he acts like a madman. He sings, he dances, he just yells and does all kinds of crazy stuff. But it's not like you can imitate that. That's persons who are actually there. That's if somebody imitates, it's simply imitation and has no value. It's only a disturbance. But yeah, when there are when one people when a person gets on a high spiritual platform and they only want God, but not only want God's for their own happiness, they want God so they can serve God. That's the whole thing. Wanting God means to serve God. <laughs> We only have one relationship with Krishna, and that's through service. It's not that we can enjoy Krishna or enjoy the spiritual master. We serve the spiritual master. We serve the Lord. The enjoyment comes through the service and not not as a feature of, of you know, this is what I'm trying to do. But Krishna consciousness is so is enjoyable by nature. If you're engaged in devotional service, it's fun. 
It's nice. If you're feeling, Prabhupada said, if you're not feeling happy, you're in Maya. So, devotional service is meant to make you happy. Chant, be happy. Take prasad, be happy. Serve, be happy. Be happy. <laughs> Sounds too simplistic, huh? <laughs> Being happy doesn't mean some external show of emotion. It means there's a certain sense of satisfaction that comes within the heart. And one is completely happy within and satisfied. There's no anxiety. There's no, what we say, frustration. The only anxiety they may have is spiritual anxiety. That's different. Spiritual anxiety means... Uh, I'm trying to serve the Lord, but I can't serve to my the, the way I want to serve. Therefore, I, I'm in anxiety because my service is not good enough. That's, spiritual anxiety is different. That's, that's a whole different realm. So what's material and what's spiritual is all based on consciousness and not always by external show. So you mentioned this person. Is he actually a great devotee of God or is it just some show? Yeah. You have to see. You may not be able to understand externally. Okay, I think we're up to nine o'clock. So there's another session at... 11.30, we're going to start talking about fault finding. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> Some of the, one of the features of the mind is to find faults. So we'll talk a little bit about what are faults and why the living entity gets attached to finding faults and how to get rid of this fault finding mentality. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai.